Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Anne Marie Jean, and I'm a member of the Discovery Committee Lifelong Learning at the Senior Center in Hingham. Today, I am happy to welcome Mr. Anthony Simaco. Anthony has been referred to as the Balzac of Boston history by the Boston Globe. Uh, he has written so over 70 books, among which are Lost Boston, The History of Howard Johnson's, How a Massachusetts Soda Fountain Became a Roadside Icon, Jordan Marsh, New England's largest store, and The Baker Chocolate Company, A Sweet History, have made the bestsellers lists. Among his accolades are Mr. Samako has received the Bullfinch Award from the Doric Dames of Massachusetts State House, the Washington Medal from Freedom Foundation. He also has was named the Dorchester Town Historian by Raymond L. Flynn, Mayor of Boston, for his work in local history. He was elected a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society, is a member of the Boston Authors Club, a proprietor of the Boston Athenaeum, and the St. Patolf Club in Boston. It is with great pleasure that I present to you this morning, Mr. Anthony Samako. Thank you, Mr. Samako. Very much, Anne Marie. I know how difficult Zoom can be, believe me. <laughs> ago, when I realized that I could never lecture again, it seemed, in person, I had to learn Zoom. And it was the most difficult and arduous task. It was just incredible. And of course, with Zoom meetings, even in my office, as well as teaching at Boston University by Zoom, it was really a, a challenge. So thank you for actually being so kind about that. I think in a lot of ways, when I write these books and Jordan Marsh, New England's largest store is something that everybody remembers. I try to actually use shared memories, not only mine and yours, but everyone else's. And if you're of a certain age, over 45, you usually remember Jordan Marsh. It really was the major department store in downtown Boston. But over the last few years, I've been writing a lot of different types of books, and I've begun a thing called Christmas Traditions in Boston. Following it, I also did Thanksgiving traditions, Easter traditions, my Valentine's Day traditions will be out in February, and Halloween traditions will be out for Halloween in 2022. These are things that make history fun, and local history can be fascinating. So when Jordan Marsh itself was actually profit for my publisher as a book that I could possibly do, I jumped on it. It was really quite fun. And I think in some ways, when we say it was New England's largest store, it truly was. And seen here in a photograph on the cover of the Tower Building in 1884, this was at the corner of Washington Street and Avon Place. And it began to show what truly a department store was all about. Well, the whole idea about Jordan Marsh was they used wonderful graphics in the 19th and 20th century in every advertisement. This was used between 1895 and 1916, and it shows Jordan, Marsh, and Co., and you see two winged griffins on either side. But there's a shield in the very center, and directly above the shield is an arm in armor holding a dagger. I always assume this is not only a beautiful graphic, but maybe they were slicing or slashing prices. But Jordan Marsh truly at that period of time had become a major department store and it was started by two men, seen here as Ebendiah Jordan and his partner, Benjamin Lloyd Marsh. I don't have a photograph of Marsh, but the two of them were once well-known dry goods merchants on Hanover Street in Boston's North End. Both of them started in 1841 and were doing quite well. But in 1851, the two of them joined forces and they actually created a company known as Jordan and Marsh. Now, in that period of time, from 1851 to 1871, the company would move four times, but it also increased every single year. And in that instance, within a year, they would take out not only a new partner, Charles Marsh, who was the younger brother of Benjamin Marsh, who would head up the wholesale division, but they also had Charles Fisk, who was actually quite a well-known salesman of the period. These four men, the two partners who founded it and two junior partners, 
in some ways, would move to 18 and 20 Pearl Street in downtown Boston. This building was known as the Cruff Block. Isaac Cruff was a well-known builder and land developer in Boston in the 1830s to the 1860s. And he was basically changing downtown Boston from a residential neighborhood into a commercial one. Well, Jordan Marsh and Company would actually have the ground floor and the second floor. But within a year, they had increased in such size and scale that they took the entire building. And within two years, they took 16 and 22 Pearl Street. So it was one of the largest dry goods stores in Boston. And what is a dry goods store? Well, it could be everything from bolts of material, linens, lace, sewing accoutrements, as well as things that actually created anything that could be sold. It was dry goods. And in that way, they themselves, by the period of the 1860s, had increased in such size and scale that they moved to Devonshire Street. Now, this is the earliest trade card I've ever found of Jordan Marsh and Company, and it says that they were importers of foreign and dealers in American dry goods, and they were located in the Freestone Building. This was a new structure, five stories in height, built of granite, and it was a major feature in the town of Boston. Boston was changing, and of course, these stores were creating, in some ways, a major place to actually do one shopping. Now, at that period of time, if you purchased something that was too large to carry home, Jordan Marsh and Company had a carriage that was horse-drawn. They kept a paddock of over 144 horses, and seen here in 1876, it's either for the 25th anniversary of the founding of the company, or it's the 100th anniversary of the United States. But you can see the grooms on either side of the horses with a flower bedecked carriage. Well, this was a major feature, not only to be able to shop in downtown Boston, but to have it delivered. Originally, they were located from 1871 on in the building in the very center left. This was a structure that was designed by Nathaniel Bradley and built in the 1860s. But in 1881, they actually had the tower building seen in the center built. This was five stories in height. It was not only, again, designed by Nathaniel Bradley, but his successor firm of Bradley, Winslow, and Weatherall. And as you can see on the corner, it was cantilevered, and you would enter the doors. But directly above the front doors were three huge two-story plate glass windows. And these were windows where models would actually show the latest fashions brought from London and Paris and Berlin to the pedestrians who would actually be walking the streets of Boston. In this instance, Jordan Marsh was something that not only could you shop in person, but it was also something that began to have a mail order through a catalog. And this is a detail of a much larger advertisement from the 1880s. You can see the cantilevered entrance with gasoliers on either side, people waiting to enter into Jordan Marsh at its 9 a.m. opening. But directly above was the mail order department. And from that little hole that shows, of course, in a demi-lune window, every state and territory in the United States, mail order orders would actually cascade and they were collected by small little pudai or angels. And in that way, between shopping in person and shopping by a catalog and actually sending a mail order, the company was increasing every year. And in that way, many people realized that that new tower building was something that wasn't just state of the art, but it was also a place that had a grand staircase that ascended five stories. Well, the company new building had actually been modeled on Bon Marche, which was Paris's leading department store. And as you can see here, it was as important to be shopping at Jordan Marsh as it was to actually be seen shopping at Jordan Marsh. And in that way, many people would come in their finest clothing, white gloves and hats to actually peruse the 224 departments that the company actually offered almost everything under the sun. Not only did they have local merchandise, but they imported from Western Europe, Eastern Europe, as well as the Middle East and China. And in that way, these departments, which were staffed, as you can see here in this postcard from 1905, with at least a dozen people per department, would actually begin to offer things such as here, men's daylight clothing, 
Now, this was not to be confused with men's evening clothing, men's weekend clothing, sporting clothing, yachting clothing. But in this instance, the daylight clothing would actually offer ready-made suits, something that was novel at the turn of the 20th century. So you could choose a jacket and a pair of trousers, and it could actually be hemmed or alterations within a day. So within two days, you would actually have a suit that one could wear. Whereas even 20 years before, one would have to wait anywhere from eight to 12 weeks as a tailor would actually perform it, cutting the material and making it available. But these departments would go the gamut of women's clothing, men's clothing, children's clothing, as well as even household goods. But the whole idea was a profit. And Jordan and Marsh wanted to actually offer it, not just to people in Boston, but also New England, as well as even as far as California. And they began as early as the 1880s with catalogs that were upwards of 100 pages. And one could order a dress from a variety of different fabrics, as well as different details that could then be simply shipped to you. Well, seen here, this is the spring and summer of 1889 catalog, and it shows the tower building in the very center. But it also shows that much of their material was coming by both boat and railroad. And during this period, these catalogs actually showed tremendous amounts of things that would even be continued by 1910. And this shows Jordan Marsh with the buyers at the very top sending things back to Boston through a cornucopia and spewing forth to be delivered to the tower building, either by paddle boat, railroad car, or horse-drawn wagon. Now, in this instance, the company's profits were not only increasing, but so too weren't sales. And in that way, many people might purchase a simple thing, or they might even buy a suite of furniture for their house. One of the things that they decided they were going to do was to extend credit. Now, credit is something that many of us use a credit card today, but Jordan Marsh was the first of the department stores in Boston to offer a charge token. Now, this token was the size of a silver dollar, and here on the obverse was J.M. Co. within a circle, coronet, and swords on either side, and on the obverse would actually be a number. That number would be assigned to you if you actually pass the credit test. And usually it was $25. You could charge up to $25 and you could actually do it without interest for six months. So it allowed people to buy something a little bit larger, maybe a living room set, a sofa, maybe even a carpet or a bedroom set. And in that instance, this would increase the company by over 20% just in one year by extending credit. And it was an important feature to realize that Jordan Marsh also had pneumatic tubes. Now, the pneumatic tubes would connect every department to this, the pneumatic cash desk. Now, I don't know about you. Do you ever go to a bank and you actually place your deposit in a tube and it goes up and around and the teller at the bank actually sends it back? Well, we go every Saturday, even if we only need something small, because every time it comes back, my dog looks in glorification that there's a dog biscuit in that thing, as well as a few dollars of cash. Well, that was something that Jordan Marsh did in the 1880s. There were five miles of pneumatic tubes. So the clerk never had to handle the money or the charge token. They simply placed it in that pneumatic tube and up and it went. These women would then either place the cash from what was basically the purchase back into the tube or a charge slip that the customer would then sign. And this was a major feature. By asserting the fact that one was credit worthy was one thing, but then extending $25, which sounds ridiculous today, but in the 1880s was a tremendous sum of money, you began to realize that people looked at Jordan Marsh as not just a department store, but it was something that was then a destination. And in that way, many people realized that the horse-drawn delivery carts were not only wonderful, you can imagine children, you know, seeing this horse come up the street with this cart, but by 1915, they began to motorize all of their individual deliveries. 
And if you did purchase a piece of furniture as these men are taking off the truck, it would then be delivered to you six days a week throughout the Boston area, and usually once a week, at least 50 to 60 miles north, west, or south of the city. Well, in a lot of ways, Jordan Marsh increased tremendously, and downtown Boston had places such as not just Jordan's, Filene's, Kennedy's, R.H. Stern's, R.H. White, there was Raymond's, there was Conrad and Chandler, Gilchrist, there was Ellen Slattery, and even Siegel's. But seen here at Washington Street with Winter Street on the left and Avon Place on the right, there's a little sign on the upper left-hand side, and it says it's the busiest corner on Boston's busiest street. Now, this says the shopping hour. So not only were people actually shopping, but you also had people on their lunch hour, probably doing errands or shopping for themselves. You also had streetcars that would connect town to the suburbs, as well as even further afield. And you began to realize before the advent of suburban shopping malls, going to town was a major feature. And many people realized in some ways, you had a greater selection than you might on the main street in either your neighborhood of Boston or surrounding city or town. But during the period of the early 20th century, Jordan Marsh wanted to claim that they were the mercantile heart of New England. And seen here, superimposed on a map of New England, we see not within just a heart, the left-hand side was the tower building and on the right-hand side was the annex. By this period, Jordan Marsh had over two miles of roofing that actually covered 224 departments. And in that way, they were not only the largest, but they also had the most diverse. Well, Benjamin Marsh died young, but of course here, Eben Jordan himself continued to run the company until his death in 1895. When he died, he died worth over $70 million. And in 1895, that was a tremendous sum of money. But he had built up this company with only $5,000 of capital into a multi-million dollar company. His son would eventually take over the company. And seen here on the right-hand side, that original building that they had purchased in 1871 would later straddle the entire block between Summer Street, Washington Street, Avon Place, and Chauncey Street. And we realized in some ways, and this is a photograph of 1905, that it was not just a place to do quick shopping, but it was also a place that had white sales in January. And they would also have bargains on Wednesdays when one could use Jordan Marsh dollars. So in that instance, the company would then be taken over by his son, Eben Dyer Jordan Jr. Educated at Milton Academy and Harvard University, he was somebody who was equipped with a good education. And after his graduation from college, he started at Jordan Marsh. And after six weeks of ardent, not only labor, but sweeping the floors and stocking the shelves, he was named an executive vice president. Well, in that way, he was somebody who actually took over for his father in a way to create the company in such a great aspect as a major department. His vice president was George Mitten, a man who actually had attended uh, Suffolk University, and he was really quite an adept man. So between Jordan as president and Mitten as vice president, these two men created a new aspect for a department store in the 20th century. And the two of them were really quite a good pair. But in that instance, you realized in some ways, by 1926, the company was going to celebrate its 75th anniversary, its Diamond Jubilee. Not many companies even today can actually claim that they're over 75 years of age. But during this period, these two men were something that were not only successful, but they continued in some ways to attract a very broad, diverse audience. Now, during the 1919 period, they actually invented what they called a quarter century club. Now, it sounds interesting. It was for every employee who had been employed with them for over 25 years. At that point, they received a check for $500 and a small brooch that actually said 25 years. 
But in 1926, the height of their, their Diamond Jubilee, they created a half century club. Now, can you imagine any business today having employees with them for over 50 years? Well, in that instance, both Jordan and of course, Mitten would continue this. And they created something where people were not only appreciated for what they did, whether they were the dock workers or they swept the streets or they actually even stocked the shelves or they were the clerks. It was an attraction and everyone felt they were part of the business. This photograph, which is on a Wednesday and probably dates to about 1945, shows people going to Dollar Day. And Dollar Day was when Jordan Marsh would mark down many things to a simple dollar. And people did actually come in droves. But in that period of time, the Mitten family would actually have three members that would replace the Jordans. They brought the company after Eben Jordan Jr. died. And seen here was Edward Richardson Mitten, who was president between 1937 and 1963. He's actually handing an award called the Mitten Art Medal to a man by the name of Robert Douglas Hunter. They would encourage people since 1882 to enter both professional and amateur paintings that would then be judged by the people to actually receive an award. Well, Robert Douglas Hunter became an extremely well-known artist, and this is a portrait of his brother, Robbie, and he would receive the medal two years in a row. He also would receive a check for $1,000 and a lunch at Lockover's. So by doing this, at the top of the annex, so you actually had to take the escalator all the way up. You could then vote after having seen the art exhibit, but on the way down, it was hoped that you would stop and maybe make a purchase. Well, art exhibits were just as important as, of course, employees. And George Mitten, the man who served as president after Eben Jordan Jr. from 1916 until 1930, would actually have this plaque placed just to the left of the employee's entrance. And it said, and this is a quote that he actually had made, quote, here and after there shall be no such term as a Jordan Marsh employee. From here on, we are all fellow workers, regardless of our position with the company, unquote. Well, when this was dedicated in 1951, you had two major clubs, a quarter century club, and a half century club. And I think in some ways, many businesses would also encourage their employees if they were happy, that was wonderful and they would stay. Well, the whole idea was seen here, this is the half century club in 1953. I love the photograph of the three women being inducted into the half century club on the right with their hats, corsages, and look at the smiles. You began to realize that Edward Richardson Mitten and his wife on the left-hand side probably were pleased as punch that these women had actually spent their entire career with the company. But what he would also do is he would have a luncheon at a major hotel, often the Statler, which is now the Park Plaza, and they would be able to invite their family and friends. And of course, during that wonderful luncheon, they'd receive a check for $3,000 along with a platinum brooch with five diamonds representing each decade of their service. So in this instance, it wasn't just the fact of being recognized, it was also the fact that it was a luncheon that you were recognized and went to every single year, even after retirement. Here in 1963, in the very center, Mr. Mitten had actually just stepped down as president and become chairman of the board. And you realize in this instance that these women, again, being inducted into the half century club would actually sit there with beaming faces. Notice they're all holding that envelope of $3,000. You know, in 1950 and 1960, $3,000 was almost a down payment for a house. So it was something in a lot of ways to recognize their fellow employees service to the company. Well, in a lot of ways, when I was doing the book on Jordan Marsh, I was also a little bit astonished. One of the things the company did was after the Great Depression in 1929, they started a parade on Thanksgiving morning. And you began to realize that it would herald 
the shopping season for Christmas. And here in a photograph from the 1940s, early 1940s, you see Santa Claus and his son. Never knew Santa Claus had a son, but this was called the Santa Sun Parade. You would see them arriving at the Fenway and the parade would start on Beacon Street at Kenmore Square and parade to the State House and then down Park Street and Winter Street, ending at Jordan Marsh. Well, this was a parade begun in 1929 that would bring thousands of people on an annual basis. And many of the balloons were the things that had once flown in the Macy's Day Parade in New York. I don't know what the name of this balloon would be. I'd call it an insect. But the insect was probably three stories long and two stories high. But because it was filled with air that would allow it to ascend into the heavens, it had to have guide wires. And they were held by people, as you see here in the foreground. Not only are they dressed as clowns, Celtic warriors with swords and shields, men from China and men from Arabia. But look at the people. This would attract people beginning at 10 in the morning, but usually go until about noontime. And many of these characters were really quite fun. This is a disembodied head. It really doesn't mean anything, but it was a balloon that would be held by men dressed in Prussian infantry uniforms. And again, look at the people lining not only Beacon Street, 10, 12, 15 deep, but people on the windows and balconies of the row houses facing the Boston Common. There were also balloons such as the double-headed giant. And seen here, the giant not only had bandanas, but gold rings in his ears, as well as one holding a spiked mace. And this was something that was four stories in height. You can imagine the children looking at something of this sort, just as we do today at Macy's Day Parade. And you realize not only was it fun, but this was the height of the depression. Jordan Marsh gave back to people. And in a lot of ways, as you see here on Summer Street, look at the depth of the people on either side. It actually continued right up until 1943. And at that time, it was discontinued. The height of the war was something that they not only needed the silk of the balloons for parachutes, but they also needed the gases that actually inflated these wonderful balloons for the war effort. It never was repeated. But during that period of time, Jordan Marsh was also beginning to prepare for their 100th anniversary. So not only did they have employees working 25 and 50 years, but Jordan Marsh in 1951 would be 100 years old. Seen here at the corner of Chauncey and Summer Streets, they decided to commission a new building, and they envisioned it as nine stories with two stories for basements, and it would actually encompass that entire block, Chauncey Street, Avon Street, Washington Street, and Summer Street. Only two portions were actually built. But as you can see here, it was built of red brick, colonial revival details, as well as a wonderful rounded three-story window. Well, they didn't hire just any architect. They hired Perry Shaw and Hepburn, one of the major architects of the United States. They got their claim to fame because they had restored Colonial Williamsburg, thanks to the Rockefeller family. And in the 1940s, they were designing not just college campuses, but even school campuses. So this was a major coup. When this was built between 1947 and 1950, it not only had air conditioning, central heat, it not only had electric recess lighting, but the sidewalks had radiant heat. So no rain, snow, or slush could deter you from shopping at Jordan Marsh. And the idea was when it opened, of course, it was for the 100th anniversary. And it would have this neon sign over that three-story rounded bay window. And of course, the 100th anniversary would blink every half minute. Going by it quickly, it must have been an attractive thing with the different colored lights. But you can imagine the competitors and other department stores in the neighborhood seeing this for 365 days and you realize that every half minute it blinked. Well, it really was a great attraction. And Jordan Marsh in that period not only created a commemorative plate, but they show in the very center what Perry Shaw and Hepburn had envisioned. 
This was to be a very nice colonial revival structure, three stories in height with a modern high rise department store. The unfortunate thing was it didn't actually get completed. But this plate was commissioned by Wedgwood and Wedgwood would produce these plates in different colors and it showed along the rim the different locations of Jordan Marsh between 1851 and of course 1951. In that way, you could actually purchase these in the gift department and entertain family and friends celebrating Jordan Marsh's 100th anniversary. But the interior of the store was something that was really quite modern for the time. In 1951, it not only had radiant lighting, it had escalators, it had elevators, central heat, and as you can see here, lighted display cases. This is the modern day version of men's shirts. And men's shirts would go the gamut from a 14 neck up to a 24 neck. And you not only had shirts, but they went the gamut of colors, not just white and blue, but many were multicolored and striped. You'd have Pima cotton, Egyptian cotton, um, Oxford cotton and different types. You'd also have ties and men's accoutrements such as handkerchiefs, as well as even socks. It was a major feature and Jordan Marsh at that time was doing quite well with it. But during the period of the early 1950s, because they had ended the Thanksgiving Day Parade, Jordan Marsh wanted to do something that would be decorated in a way for the holidays. And seen here on the parapet designed by Perry Shaw and Hepburn that overhung Summer Street in the foreground with plate glass display windows, they would place a life-size nativity crash directly above. And with Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, the three kings on camels and shepherds with sheep, it was something you couldn't miss coming up from the Underground Railroad. And in that way, not only did they have twinkling lights, but they also had the Star of Bethlehem surmounting the entire tableau. In that instance, people began to realize it wasn't just attractive and it wasn't just the fact that there was canned music that you would hear, but it was also the period of time all department stores made their biggest profits. Between the day after Thanksgiving and Little Christmas, it was said that upwards of 40% of the average annual sales were made in that six week period. But why not go to Jordan Marsh? Maybe Santa Claus was there. And seen here, and this is 1963, the little boy on the left seems very happy, but the little boy in the center is screaming. Maybe Santa Claus said he couldn't have a certain toy, but Santa Claus was a major feature. And there'd be elves handing out not only candy canes to the children, but the elves would eventually allow you entry into the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. Now, I'm sure if you were raised in Boston, you all attended the Enchanted Village. It was something that started in 1959, and it became a tradition in Boston for many people to go even two or three times each season. But Mr. Mitten, who was actually the president during, as I said, 1937 to 1963, wanted to reopen trade with Germany. Now, Germany, of course, had been a Axis power during World War II. And the United States had actually cut off all trade and communication. And during that period, it would actually be split between East Germany and West Germany. Well, by the 1950s, at one time, Jordan Marsh had imported probably 15% of their goods from Germany. And they wanted to reopen trade with West Germany. The federal government finally granted permission to Jordan Marsh to actually purchase 20, 224 automatons, not only men, women, and children, but animals that would be created in a way out of what was the toy maker of Coburg in West Germany. And that toy maker was a man by the name of Hans um, Christian. He himself was a grandson of the man who actually produced toys for the Duke of Coburg's children. But by the 1930s and 40s, he was creating these automatons that could actually move in unison to create a very interesting tableau. 
Well, the Enchanted Village was supposed to be an enchanted village of the 19th century in a German town, three quarters in size, and it went the gamut of 24 individual tableaus. And as you see here in the distance, people would simply walk along pathways with stanchions, looking at the animals as music was played. Jordan Marsh hired a trio, three men from the Sherry Biltmore that was on Massachusetts Avenue, that would dress in Tyrolean costumes, and of course, Lederhosen, and they would actually play Germanic themes. When they broke for a break, they then would actually have an organist playing religious themes. But seen here, these tableaus themselves with the partition on the foreground would be everything from a living room, a dining room, a bakery, an ice cream shop, or even the village jail. And you see these figures that would actually move not only outside of the tableaus, but within. And in many instances, this was something lit from behind with beautiful greenery, as well as interesting topics that people would love to see. Well, early on in 1959, just before it opened to the public, Look Magazine actually had a photo shoot and they brought children to actually sit with the automaton figures. Now this was the tableau of the glass blower shop. And on the left-hand side is an automaton if he could, he would lift that hand blowing tube to create the ornaments that hang from the shelf directly above. Well, if you liked those ornaments, they were available in the gift shop on the way out. They also had things such as the schoolmaster's house. And the schoolmaster, probably with the most bushy eyebrows and hair I've ever seen, would actually bow to the children who were writing on both blackboards and on slates. So you began to realize in some ways that this was something that was really quite fun. But you also had this, the bakery. And the man in the distance was actually raising trays of Germanic cookies. Now, Look Magazine not only did these in full color, but they also had the recipes for the cookies. And they showed in some ways that these were things that again were available in the bakery on the way out. Many people began to realize that this was something that was having for over a year, tremendous amounts of publicity before it opened. And on the day after Thanksgiving in 1959, it was said that over 25,000 people were in line waiting to see the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. It was a great success and actually survived right through to the 1980s, after which it was moved to the Heinz Convention Center Many of the pieces had to be replaced and eventually went to a tent on Boston City Hall Plaza. So in some instances, this was something that was a dual purpose. The first was to actually reopen trade with West Germany, which happened. But it was also something that the first year brought over a quarter of a million people to Jordan Marsh. And you can imagine, even if 10% of those people made a sale, you can imagine how profitable 1959 was. In this photograph in the very center, Edward Richardson Mitten smiles. He was quite happy. It was not only a great publicity stunt, but it was also a great economic success. On the left-hand side is the ambassador to the United States from Germany. And on the far right is the German consul in Boston. But the man in the center holding that parchment that was given to Mr. Mitten, thanking him for reopening trade with Germany, is the man who designed the automatons. And today, if you ever have a chance to go to Jordan's Furniture in Avon, Massachusetts, you too can reintroduce the Enchanted Village to your children and grandchildren. Well, in a lot of ways, in the mid 20th century, the old catalogs that have been done in the 19th century were now full color. And as it says here, Christmas gifts for all the family from New England's largest store. Well, this was for Christmas of 1950 and Santa Claus has just come down the chimney and he looks at the children and what do they have? Well, the little boy standing has his Hopalong Cassidy holster and gun set, his little hat, the little girl holds a porcelain doll from Madame Alexander in Paris, and the other little boy sitting on the carpet, two toys, a fire truck and a delivery truck. Well, in a lot of ways, 
again, these catalogs could actually be something that not only you could look at at home, but you could place an order by telephone now, as well as mail order or United States Postal Service. And one of the things about Jordan's was you could still shop in person, but you could still, in some instances, find things that were really quite unique. Well, this is a photograph from the mid 1950s. And it's those plate glass windows where the models had once paraded the latest fashions. But here, Santa Claus opens a book called Tales from Mother Goose. And Mother Goose and the sheep actually escape. And where are they going? Well, directly below it says they're going to New England's largest toy land on the fifth floor of the annex. Well, any child worth their medal was somebody who would actually arrive at the toy land and realize that there was everything available under the sun. Seen here, there was a train set almost as big as a room. And the trains would run from the time the store opened until it closed. And you can see here with styrofoam hills, dells, tunnels, as well as little villages, it attracted children, young teenagers, as well as adults. And these were things that you could still purchase. This might be a little bit too large for your home, but you could purchase this, which was a seven piece farm set. And this, which was only $22.50 in 1957, which was a considerable sum of money, not only provided, as you see here, an engine, coal car, as well as all other cars, but you could buy all of the little intricate things in the foreground, such as a mower and a wagon, a barn, a farmhouse, or a garage. So you could create a village with the train going around. They also had, as you see here, airplanes and ships. And this couple with their two young sons probably realized that these things with their propellers that actually turned were things that were quite lovely. You could always look, but they were terribly expensive. In that instance, they did have inexpensive things as well as the luxury items. And seen here with a model car race set, this was something that would show not only figure eights, but the cars could actually race to the finish line. Now look at the people in the distance. It goes the gamut, adults, young adults, teenagers, and even children. And you too could have a smaller version of this if you wish to purchase it from Toyland. Well, Toyland really did encompass everything for every child. And whether it was ordered by the catalog or purchased in store, you would bring it to the counter. This poor woman on the left is probably Christmas Eve. She's wrapping a battleground play set with not only twine, but a little wooden handle for somebody to carry it home on the subway. Frazzled, working eight hours a day, you can imagine these people during the holiday season. But in a lot of ways, it was a great place to visit, even if one was window shopping. But one of the places on the first floor of the annex was the old bakery. And if you ever went to town and didn't bring home a box of Jordan Marsh blueberry muffins, your name would actually be synonymous with hell. In that instance, the bakery was something that provided everything from pies, such as cherry pie for Washington's birthday, Irish bread for St. Patrick's Day, as well as pumpkin pies, mince pies, and of course, blueberry muffins. During that period of time, the food shop was something that not only had gourmet gift baskets on the right-hand side, but after you took your ticket from the machine and stood in line, you hoped there were still blueberry muffins left. The bakery was very popular. And they did lovely wedding cakes, birthday cakes, as well as all sorts of things from brownies and cookies. But one of the major things that Jordan Marsh became synonymous for was their delicious blueberry muffins. And this was an advertisement from 1967 saying that Jordan Marsh was looking for experienced baker and baker apprentice. They had a night shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., liberal fringe benefits, including store discount after only two weeks of employment. But they always had 24 bakers and bakers apprentices on site. And in that instance, they created things that everyone loved. And seen here is John Pupik, who was one of the senior bakers who made a tray of the delicious blueberry muffins. Now, 
No matter how much we try, we can never seem to replicate what the Jordan Marsh blueberry muffin was. I assume that half of the blueberries were frozen and the other half were actually mashed and put into this along with castor sugar on the top. It was something that not only was delicious, but it's a great memory from the past. But Jordan Marsh during the holiday seasons also did gift boxes. And many times these boxes from the 1950s right through the 1980s showed a stagecoach with people coming into town with four horses. You began to realize you didn't have to have a gift wrapped. It was a beautiful box in its own. But if you purchased something at Jordan's, you could usually go to gift wrap. And at least three different designs with a bow were available free of charge. But if you spent an extra dollar or two, you could get not only custom papers, but the biggest bow you could imagine. Jordan's was all encompassing. But also in 1951, not only the 100th anniversary of the company, Jordan Marsh also opened its first suburban store. Now, many people realized after World War II, we also had the GI Bill. And the GI Bill allowed a whole new generation to go back to college or to attend college. And the GI Bill not only provided the money necessary for one's education, but it also provided a little bit of extra money for support. Many people were married. And during the 1950s, the idea of people moving out of Boston because of the ascendancy of the automobile meant that the area of Route 9 going west would actually be a place of new housing. Well, Jordan Marsh decided to place a new store at what's called Shoppers World. And Shoppers World in Framingham was a place that not only was available for people living in the western suburbs, but it came equipped with open areas for parking. Now, the Jordan Marsh store had a dome. And the surprising thing is this was one of the largest domes in the world. You may not realize it, but the first dome that was ever built that is the largest was the Vatican in Rome. The second was St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And can you imagine that the third largest dome in the world was Jordan Marsh's dome in Framingham? Well, that store was something that not only was an anchor, but would be the first of a series of stores that were built in suburban shopping malls. And people would look at Jordan Marsh, not just as their flagship store in downtown Boston, seen here at Chauncey and Summer Streets, but also as something that provided 224 departments of things that went the gamut from clothing and furs, trunks, furniture, as well as even rugs. And you began to see that Jordan Marsh founded by Ebendiah Jordan and Benjamin Lloyd Marsh, had become in this instance, one of the leading department stores, not just in Boston, but the largest in New England. So when I wrote this book, Jordan Marsh, what I tried to do was not only show how the company grew, but also to show how the employees, so thankfully um, recognized by George Mitten as fellow employees, but to show it in a way that was something that was actually something that each one of us probably shopped in more than once. As a child, I went there. My first communion outfit was actually purchased at Jordan Marsh. And every May, we were actually photographed in the photographs the stu studio. In many instances, it was a rite of passage, not just for my family, but probably for yours. So by doing local history, such as a department store, one might not necessarily think that this was something that was all that much of a deal. But when we tell our children and grandchildren all about Jordan Marsh, sometimes one can never imagine what it meant to us. So my history is something in this instance that I not only write to actually chronicle and preserve it, but I hope it will always attract attention and be of interest to the general public. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Mr. Simakal, for a wonderful presentation. You are well informed and your presentation was a delight. As I panned the gallery, I could see people smiling, laughing, shaking their heads. So just a wonderful time for us uh, going down memory lane with you.